Hello everyone, welcome back to the Topical Hour. Today we're going to be rapidly reviewing Guardians of the Galaxy, or we're going to try our best. It's a pretty long game. This review is pretty special to me because I feel like very few people have talked about this game since it came out. I mean, that's not for no reason. The same company that produced the Avengers game made this game, and I'm never reviewing the Avengers game, so that should testify to its actual quality. But Guardians of the Galaxy is a different breed of game. I took a big risk in buying this game only because it was on sale, and I gotta say, the chance paid off in a pretty big way because I gotta admit, this game's pretty good. So I guess we'll start with the gameplay, which is somehow the weakest part of the game. And that's not a knock on the gameplay in any sense, I just wanted to say that the story and other things are even better somehow. Although admittedly, you can tell that the gameplay is the weakest part pretty fast. First off, a lot of people, including myself, were really disappointed with the reveal that you'd only be playing as Star-Lord for the whole game, but that's not really an issue here. Really you play as the whole team, choosing which attacks and special moves to use at any given time. Now I know I say this in every video and it always sounds like a flex, but I really mean it this time. This game is better when you play on higher difficulties. But I want to clarify this point by adding that this game's progression is still pretty good. The game's story is pretty long, so if you just level up and get story-logged abilities along the way, you should have a pretty alright time with progression. However, if you've played games like God of War or Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order, both of which I'll review someday, where dodging is mandatory, then it's basically the same for this game. If you know when to dodge and how to use the R2 RT triggers, then you should be fine in combat. The only times I died was when I got lazy or stopped paying attention to my health bar, so I'd be genuinely shocked when Peter just crumpled to the ground as if he didn't have any bones. But still, if you've played video games before, this game will probably be a little bit too easy if you don't crank up the difficulty. By the way guys, I played this game on the hardest difficulty. So as for the other four guardians you play with, I really like them. I mean it, all of them. Groot is really good for holding down a bunch of small enemies or a single large enemy so everyone can lay into them. All of Gamora's attacks are pretty high damage except for like a single one. Rocket's starting bomb attack is never not suited for a situation, along with his special ability to unload his arsenal into tough enemies. I mean, if I had to pick a weak link, it'd be Drax, surprisingly, even if he's canonically the strongest. He's only good for specific situations, especially ones that require stun damage, but he really comes in clutch during those situations, so he's still a great addition to the team. As for Peter's abilities, I wish his Eye of the Storm packed a bit of an extra punch, I wish he could glide for longer, and I wish he could dodge cancel his super damage attack with the elemental guns. I just wish that his special weapons felt just as useful as everyone else's, but I'm also fine with there being more emphasis on the rest of the team and him taking more of a leadership-ish role. I guess this goes along with gameplay, but whoever came up with the huddle up idea deserves a raise. The idea that Peter has to keep his team in check or boost their spirits is cool, especially when it actually depends on how well the fight is going and whether it's in your favor or not. However, there is a tiny flaw in that I wish it was harder to distinguish what to say during these situations. The mechanic that you have to make the right choice in picking what to say is like dead weight because of how easy it is. I only got the choice wrong once and it was the very first time because I didn't know what I was doing. Otherwise, pretty fun mechanic. It always gives me a little dopamine boost and makes me smile to shoot people into oblivion while listening to music. It really just has that Guardians of the Galaxy vibe and I'm all for it. Now for the elemental guns, which I kind of wish they didn't look like a PS5, but alright. I know the MCU's guns don't look much better, they don't look like they do a singular bit of damage, but these ones look comically large at times. As for the actual elements, I like them. They're fine. The wind and magma elements are a little bit on the nose, but I really like the lightning and ice elements, and I primarily use ice in gameplay because of how easy it is to kill frozen enemies. But I think they're just fine. Not too overpowered, but definitely helps in gameplay. Now I guess we'll get to the best part of this game, the story and characters. The game starts off with the Guardians trying to catch a monster in a place they shouldn't be to give to Lady Hellbender, who's essentially a monster keeper. While doing this, they come across the Soul Stone and accidentally release a being, Magus, from within it. From there, it's basically just the Guardians trying to pay off a fine from Novacor, the space police, for trying to catch the monster. But they discover that the central hub of Novacor is in distress, and Cosmo, a psychic space dog. This... This game gets kind of weird. Sends them on a mission to find out what's happening. They discover that a church has basically been spreading propaganda and telling people that they can have their dead loved ones back if they accept the promise. This lie spreads faster than Shmovid 29 and basically the whole galaxy says, well, they're too strong, so I guess we have to accept defeat and get our loved ones back. By the way, guys, this was probably the briefest of summaries for this game, and I'll go more in depth about the ending later, but you should really play it for yourself before you watch this video. I promise it's worth your time and money. So basically, the Guardians have to do everything themselves and save the galaxy, but before we can talk about the ending, we have to talk about the characters. So every single character in this game is three-dimensional. Except for Groot, but that's fine, because giving him a sacrifice or something would have copied the movies and he's also got a huge role in the gameplay because he'll revive you when you die. So we'll go one by one, starting with Rocket. Rocket probably has the most subtle of the five when it comes to arcs where he has to overcome the past and focus on the present leaving behind his fears of water and where he came from in the war. 
and just living with his new family. At least that's what I got from it. Gamora obviously was severely abused by Thanos, her adopted father, and the death of Nebula also hit her hard, seeing as she committed the act. Mantis even mentions at one point during the game that she used to be suicidal, which I wish we found out in a different way than Mantis just telling the player, but I still like the detail that Gamora's trauma actually pushed her towards the edge. It offers a good look at trauma and PTSD that you don't get to see very often, and how it should never be glorified, but it's something that can happen to anyone. Groot is also here, and Drax, with probably the most highlighted arc, has to deal with his past in Thanos and his deceased family. Also, I do like that if you read into it, you can tell Drax didn't kill Thanos like people claim, just in the way he always shuts down the conversation when it comes to that subject. However, and this is pretty nitpicky, I wish we didn't see Thanos, or I wish we didn't see his true form. I wish in Drax's mind that we could see a more grotesque or inaccurate form of Thanos, where it's more of what Thanos represents to Drax, rather than just a pretty downplayed face reveal. Also, side note, but I don't like Mantis. Like, I know the Guardians don't really like her either, and I know she's supposed to be misleading and a little bit whimsical, but, like, I really don't like Mantis. But as you can see, there's a pretty big theme here, and it's grief, and taking the past into account, but also being able to move on. It's the most obvious with Drax, but even Gamora and Rocket feel haunted by their past. And Raker, the main antagonist of this game, besides, like, trauma, represents what happens to us when we give in to our deepest desires of wanting to stay in the past. I mean, he literally dies thinking that he won because he didn't move on, and he doesn't even recognize that he's lost, which is kind of sad. Actually, I'll take a minute to just say that if you think about this game for a minute, it's pretty sad. I mean, just getting over the war in the past, and having to let go of your family when they're right in your grasp, and having the promise, which seems so possible, be a complete lie. Which, there's always the question, maybe having your family back is worth Magus taking over your being. But this question is answered by none other than the main character who I've been avoiding. Star-Lord. Star-Lord is by far the best video game character of 2021, and it's not even a contest. I mean, if you want to argue that Arthur Kingsley from Vanguard is better, the point is, Peter Quill gets the most characterization by the end, and I think it'd be pretty easy to just have him be the leader and help out his team, rather than giving him character development, but they managed to pull off both, and that's pretty great. This game has dialogue trees which can actually influence the end of the game, but isn't so game-changing that I feel like I have to ponder my life choices anytime one pops up. As someone who's always hated when game characters feel stupid, I like that you can control Peter's relationship with the team, at least to some degree. I actually didn't originally know that you could influence the final level of the game, so I just thought it was supposed to be dumb easy and have every character return, from Cosmo to Lady Hellbender to the world mind. But the fact that playing with your whole heart rewards you with help by the end of the game, and the game actually grows harder if you don't unify your team. But off of that tangent, Peter Quill spends most of this game encouraging the Guardians and holding them all together, but inside we know that he speaks from experience. I mean, he constantly empathizes with his team because of the death of his mom and his own experiences during the war. With Drax, he understands wanting his family back and how seductive the promise can be, and with Gamora, he understands not always being able to healthily show your love for the people that deserve it. And Rocket's a combination of both, with not being able to let go of the past and show love for the team and Groot is also here. But most of all, Peter has to overcome his own past and fears, which is why it's so important that the player has to decide to shoot Magus in the dream sequence, the player has to decide to shoot Magus masturbating as Peter's mother, and why the player has to decide what to say when the team isn't operating correctly. It's that choice of forgetting what you think you know, not being so stubborn and accepting what is happening rather than dwelling on what has happened. As for the ending of this game, it's really good. Just with the final boss fight interrupting the credits and Magus infecting the credits, it's really cool. It's also really cool that no one comes to help you during this fight. With the last battle and having everyone throughout the game coming in clutch and helping the Guardians do their thing, there's not much of a threat. This is the big moment where everyone comes together and there's not much of a chance that the Guardians lose here, so there's not much anticipation. But I got a lot more anticipation under the real final fight. Oh, Oh, and as for Corel and Nikki, they're completely fine. I didn't really like that Nikki became a part of the team at the end, but I think this stems from the bigger problem in that she's a little bit too annoying when we first meet her, and she doesn't really leave that until the end where we pull her out of the promise. And as for Corel, I think I just wish she was, like, in the game more. I don't know, it just feels like she was slightly underused. Also, I don't love the mystery of whether or not Peter is the father of Nikki, because if you pretend there's a mystery around it, then you know it's not true, because if it was, you'd never even try to make it a mystery. I think I've spent enough time to talk about some of the other little parts of this game. First is the costumes. The original costumes all look fantastic. I know a lot of people, again, including myself, had an issue with the way Peter's hair was designed, but I've come to just accept it as him trying to keep a part of his past, being that crazy 80s hair, with him at all times. So I have zero issues with this haircut. You also get used to the galactic substitute swear words over time. They feel out of place at first, but at some point your mind will just accept it. The unlockable suits are okay, I just think that Groot kinda got shafted and didn't get a ton to customize, but it's just another nitpick. And one more thing, the gear upgrades in this game are pretty good, but I wish they affected gameplay just a tad bit more. They do their job, but I really wish it felt like I was improving with these upgrades. I get way more excited with the elemental upgrades over these. 
All right, guys, this is the end of the video where I give a score and it's going to get a crisp 9.5 out of 10. It's so close to perfect, but there's just a few too many nitpicks for it to truly ascend to topical hour godhood. But still, the fact that this game, coming from the people who produced Avengers, should not be this good. I mean it, I'm completely willing to say that this game is probably better than the Guardians of the Galaxy movies. It's that good. This game is better than what people consider to be the best of the MCU. It feels illegal that this game is so good, and it's a true tragedy that no one is buying the game, because if you consider yourself someone who likes good stories, good gameplay, or good characters, you're missing out on all three. Alright guys, next week I'm going to review Call of Duty Black Ops Cold War. Like I said, we're going to have some more Call of Duty content on this channel, mostly zombies, but still. And don't worry, Call of Duty is not going to clog my channel, because after that, we're doing Star Wars. Anyway, this video took a lot out of me, and I'd really appreciate it if you subscribed to give me that nice dopamine boost. Oh, and like and comment too, because like I said, dopamine. Or not, that's fine. Play nice people.